Um, today we are going to be discussing um, a lot of new features in the latest Alarm Biller release. Um, we're going to focus in today on the new general ledger features, <coughs> excuse me, including the accounts payable and um, the GL. Um, but before we go into those, um, I've been asked by quite a few people why we did this and um, why are we adding on to these additional areas of the application and what's the importance of that. And there is great importance to providing a full general ledger system. <coughs> now, as I stated in the last presentation, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to, and you can still interface with QuickBooks, and um, that will work just as it always has. But what's nice about having everything under one system is that you can do your full GL reporting right out of Alarm Biller now. And GL reporting is extremely important. So let's start off with going right into the reports. And you'll notice um, within here, you're going to have three new reports that are probably the most important reports of any business. Um, the uh, trial balance, the profit and loss, and the balance sheet. So we can run any of these reports at any time. So here is a balance sheet report. Um, you can run this report as of any date. So if I wanted to go back and run it as of the end of March, just go ahead and change the date. Um, and you can see that it's going to run the report for you. Um, the balance sheet is very important because that's going to give you all of your assets and liabilities um, and equities um, and, and gives you uh, a good picture of the uh, evaluation of a business. Um, for most businesses, the profit and loss is an extremely powerful report. Um, when you run this report, you can run it by date range. So it will always default to the current month. So since we're in April, it's running it for the whole month of April. But for example, if I wanted to run it for year to date, all I do is I come into here, I change it to January 1st through April 30th, I run my report, and now I get my profit and loss for my entire year. Um, um, I could run it for last year. Um, we are going to be adding additional reports uh, to the library. Um, we're going to have comparison um, uh, reports um, that will um, uh, allow you to compare this year to last year and this month to last month. So you're going to see a lot of more um, reports coming out in the near future. The trial balance report is just the report of every GL account as of a certain date. This is a really useful report for your um, CPA. Um, and, and they could come in here and tell you. Um, I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, I have a little issue with that. Um, but we will, um, the uh, CPA can use that report to look at every account balance and if they need to make any journal entries that they have to. So the reporting is very important and that's really the heart of the uh, general ledger and accounts payable. Now, as a precursor, um, where we're going with this is very important. And so I'm going to let the cat out of the bag a little bit. We are going to be adding not only uh, what we have now, but we want to now take it to the next level. And so over the next few months, you're going to see some new enhancements coming to the Alarm Biller platform as well. One of them is going to be an inventory module. And that's going to be allow you to do full stock tracking right down to the warehouse level of all of your parts. Now, um, we've been asked for this for quite a bit. You can't do stock tracking without having accounts payable. So we had to do the accounts payable first and the general ledger in order to do that. Now, with stock tracking comes the next big piece, and that's going to be the um, profit and loss, uh, or what we call job costing, by every job. Every work order in the system will have complete job costing. So not only for a service ticket, an installation, um, uh, inspection, whatever you do from a work order level, 
you're going to be able to go in and say, what was my profitability on that work order? Um, and you'll be able to see all of the income and all of the expenses incurred against it. Um, and so we needed to get this uh, first phase done in order to take it to the next level. Um, it also is going to allow us to look at a customer or a site or a system and tell you the profitability of that as well. So if you wanted to look at a customer and you'll be able to look at it and say, here's all the income from this customer for a year, here's all the expenses, this is what we made on this customer. You can look at it at the customer level, the site level, or the system level. And these are things that are coming, be coming out over the next few months. But in order to do that, we ne definitely needed to have the accounts payable and the general ledger. So let's talk a little bit about accounts payable. Let's go into that. So you'll notice on your toolbar, there's a new feature down here at the bottom. It says, all the way to the right, it says accounting. You have the customer portal and the vendor portal. So the customer portal is what you've been using and you're used to using. That's right here. That's your, your traditional alarm biller view. If I choose my vendor portal, it's going to just change a little bit, and now it's going to give me my vendor view. So you can switch back and forth between these at any time, um, very simply. Um, and um, so look at one. If a user <coughs> does not have access to the, uh, to the um, uh, vendors, they wouldn't be able to go into it, obviously. So when you go into the vendor portal, here you can see all of your open bills by aging, any open receipts any open credits, and what your total net AP due is. And then here is each one of our vendors. Uh, this is our top 10 vendors. If I want to look at all vendors, just like in uh, the uh, customer pool, there's a vendor list. So vendors are, are entities that you are buying things from, whether it's a utility company, your CPA, um, your uh, garbage collector, your um, uh, supply companies, ADI, um, and so on, every one of them will become a vendor within the system. Um, now, you'll notice on the top, you're going to have vendors, bills, payments, and purchase orders. Those are the four main tabs of the, um, the, uh, the vendor side or the accounts payable. The GL reports set up are universal to both sides of the system, whether you're in the vendor side or whether you're in the customer side. So let's go ahead and just look at a vendor real quick. I'm going to just click on this first vendor, and it's going to open up the vendor right here. And this is my vendor. It's called Alarm Supply. There's their address. Um, you can have an email, their web page, their remittance address, which might be different than their um, billing address for, uh, um, um, for uh, remitting um, invoices to, a sales phone number, support phone number, the reference number. The reference number is the, is the vendor's account number for you. That's their assigned account number. Your terms on how you're going to pay them, the default terms. Then here I could see any open receipts, open bills, open credits, and what the current balance is for this vendor. So as we look down here, you're going to notice we have tabs. Again, very similar to when you're looking at a customer. So here's my open purchase orders, any open receipts, and any open bills. <coughs> here's any payments we made to them, any credits that we have received from them. Um, you also have the ability to add notes for the vendor as well as documents, just like you do within a customer. So, Let's talk a little bit about the purchasing flow from a vendor. Now, there's a couple different options here. Um, you do not have to use purchase orders, but if you do, you can create purchase orders. Purchase orders can then become a receipt, or a purchase order can become a bill. Um, um, so. Um, you can skip those two and go directly to a bill. So I'm going to show you both ways. Let's start off with just creating a bill for a vendor. I could come into the bill section, and I could say add a bill. So we're just going to add a miscellaneous bill 
for this vendor. The reference number would be the reference number on that bill, the billing date, the due date, based upon the terms that automatically went to the 30 days, and the, um, the, uh, we have the uh, total amount. So if the total amount of this bill was $1,000, I would just put that in here. And then you're going to add either items or parts to that bill. So let's say we just bought some parts. So I'll click on parts, and I'm going to say which parts did we bill, did we buy, okay? And we could come down here and we could pick the parts that we had within here. So I'm just going to say that we bought this motion sensor. We bought five of them, okay? Oops. And our rate was $20, or I'll make it um, $200. So my total bill is $1,000. So you notice we have to be in balance. My total parts, so that's my total, my remaining amount. So for example, if I said in here that this rate was $150 for a total of $750, I need to be in balance between the total amount and the total amount of my parts and items. So let's just change this back to 200. Okay, so that's a bill. I could click Save, and this will actually save this bill, and now we have this new bill within the system. Now, from here, I can look at the items or the parts that were created on it. If I needed to edit it, I can. Um, this would be any payments that were applied to this bill or any credits that were applied to this bill. At this point, obviously, we haven't done any. Let's go back to the vendor before we actually make a payment on here. You'll see now, their open bills are now greater. And if I click on bills here, I can see both bills that are open for this vendor. Now, if we want to pay an individual bill or both of these bills together, we could do it in a few different ways. We could click on payments right from here, and I could click add a payment. Because I'm within this vendor, it knows to create the bill for this vendor. I could choose the bank account that I want to pick from. We talked a little bit about bank accounts last webinar. We're going to go back and talk about them a little bit more. This is the check number I want to assign to it. There's my date. And then how much do I want to pay? Now, let's just say if I wanted to pay the whole thing, I can actually just you know come over here and check these off. And you notice it will automatically add to the um, the amount that we want to pay. So I'm going to pay the $1,100. If I wanted to pay a partial amount, so maybe I only want to pay $500 of this $1,000 bill, at that point I'm just going to have to manually change this and just say $600. And that way it's kind of a checks and balance to make sure that you really want to, this is what I want to pay. So what I'm going to do, if I click Save here, it's going to add this payment for it's going to pay $100 of the first bill and $500 of the second bill of the $1,000. So let's do that. We'll click Save. And now here is my payment record that we created. And from here, I can choose View Check. The check is the check that was created for this payment. And then from here, we can choose Print. And I don't have my, my check set up right now. But once you do, we will actually print the check. And we can actually print the remittance port um, um, for this um, payment. Um, so this will do full check printing um, for your vendors to send the, the checks out to them. And then all you have to do is sign it and um, give it out to the uh, vendor. Now, at this point, let's go back into um, the uh, vendor record. and. Um, so I'll click back to my vendors, and let's go back into that alarm supply. And you notice from here, when I look at the payment, I could see that there's the payment. You could drill into it from right here. If I look at my bills now, I only have one bill that is open. And you notice the balance due now is $500. If I come over here um, and I say um, show all, you'll see all the payments in here. Um, so we do have a, a question that came in here. Can you pay the invoice through an e-check? Um, today, no. 
But yes, you will be able to. We will be adding that functionality that you will be able to do a payment directly as an e-check. So it's kind of think of it as a reverse e-check than when a customer pays you. When a customer pays you, you're going into their account and pulling money and putting it into your account. When you pay a bill through an e-check, you're going to electronically push a payment from your bank account into a vendor's account. So we don't have that yet, but um, um, but that is something that will be um, um, coming in the near future. Um, well, well, here's another uh, really good question. Uh, will the invoice number print on the check, reference number, do we have to print the remittance too? No, the, 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 the uh, remittance, the check will print the remittance and the, and the bill number. Um, the reason why we have the remittance report is um, I believe the check stub can have up to 22 bill references um, because that's all there's room for. After 22, or it might be 20, um, it doesn't have room to print anymore, so we created the remittance report. And this is a really nice thing that if you're paying ADI, for, for example, or um, Triad, and you're paying 50 bills with one check, you, you could print the report, and then you just use the report to go with the check stub. But normally the check stub, for most, I bet you 99% of the time, will, will be able to fit all of the remittances um, and the uh, bills within there. Okay, so let's continue on and let's talk about purchase orders. A purchase order is when you're requesting to buy something. So let's just go back into here and say we're going to click on add a purchase order. And once you, when, it, when you create a purchase order, you will have the option to either just receive it or to create a bill directly from that purchase order. Um, you do not have to um, use purchase orders. Um, that, that's an option, um, but you can um, you, you you can use them. And likewise, you um, can um, get the receipts if you want to use a receipt, or or get a bill if you want to use that. So let's go ahead and add that purchase order. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to come into here. And we it will automatically assign a PO number. You can override it. You can choose the shipping method um, that you want for this. Um, and we have pretty much uh, this is a fixed table because we we have um, based upon the tracking number you put in here, you can do a one click to automatically do the uh, tracking for that. And what's the expected shipping date? Then I could come into here and pick my parts. And here I'm going to say um, um, wh which part we're going to use. So let's just say I'm going to buy one of these keypads. So I'm going to say add part. And I'm going to buy 10 of them. OK. So we're going to do 10 of these for right here. Click Save. And now we added this purchase order. Now, a purchase order. Um, um, does not create any financial records. So there is no GL underneath the uh, purchase order. Um, and I'll explain that in a little bit more in just a bit. So you notice the tracking number. Um, we can click on that. I'm just going to click on that and say open in a new tab. And it will automatically, because it was FedEx, it's going to automatically um, use this um, tracking and bring it into here. Now it's telling me the tracking number could not be found because that was obviously a fictitious tracking number. So if you have a, a proper tracking number, it would, it would look it up and find that for you. OK, so there's my part that's inside of my purchase order. So at this point, let's go back into our vendor. And we have really one of two options. We could get a receipt or go directly to a bill. But let's use the receipt function. The receipt function is designed for when you receive that part into stock or you pick it up, it's to record that receipt. So sometimes you get that receipt before you get the bill from the vendor. So we could come into receipts and we could click add a new receipt. And at this point, so at this point we can um, choose the purchase order that we want to uh, pick. This will say, does this resolve the PO? 
So if we're receiving the whole amount, then it would resolve it. If we're not receiving the whole amount, then, then we, we would uncheck it, so we would leave the purchase order open. We could put a reference number in here for the reference number of that receipt. Let's just say we're going to get the part and we're going to receive all 10 of them. So it's $3,000, so I'm just going to put the amount in here. We're going to receive $3,000, and I click Save. So at this point, it's created a receipt. So the receipt now is in the system. Um, if you notice if I come back over here to the vendor, you'll notice that it shows us that we have open receipts of $3,400. Those are our two open receipts. Now, you cannot pay a receipt. You have to convert the receipt to a bill before you pay it. The reason you do that is the checks and balances. We want to make sure the bill comes in correctly, that they didn't either overcharge us, undercharge us, or maybe they added a shipping charge for that. So what can happen is we can convert that receipt to a bill, and we could do it a number of ways. We could do it by coming into bills and saying add a bill, but a real nice way to do it is when the bill comes in, just go find the receipt, click on it, and then choose the convert to bill right from here. This will convert this receipt to a bill. Are you sure you want to convert it? I say yes. And then <laughs> once we have the bill, I could come in here and say, OK, if they did charge us $300, but maybe they also charged us a shipping charge. So I could come over here and add a shipping charge expense item. I didn't set one up yet, so I'm just going to pretend like and I'm just going to modify this one. So I'll say ship, shipping charge, and I'm going to say that they charged us um, I'm just going to leave that there. Um, they, I'm going to say that they charged us $25. So you notice I'm out of balance now, so I need to change my bill amount to $3,025. Now I can click Save. And now I've created this bill within the um, within the system, okay? And the bill itself, um, when I look at the vendor, go back to my vendors here. The bill itself will be right within here. Uh, here, and now I can go ahead and I can pay the bill. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the GL and how all of that played out in this role. So let's click on the GL right here. And I'm going to go to what's called our accounts payable account. So this is our GL. This would be the balance of every GL account in the system. And I'm going to click on the Accounts Payable account here. And here you can see the transactions that were created for today. And we have quite a few of them in here. But we can have vendor bills, vendor receipts, vendor payments. So remember that payment we made for $600? There it is. And what that would have done is it would have debited our Accounts Payable because we reduced it. Accounts Payable is normally a credit balance account. And we credited our checking account to $600. Okay, um, Because this receipt was a payment, you can actually, right from here, click on and see the vendor payment right from here, too. Again, you can also print it and show the remittance from here as well. Um, that bill we created, there's the bill. And there we could see that we had the part sales, and we could see we credited our $3,000 um, for the accounts payable. So the accounts payable kind of works automatically behind the scenes. You don't really have to think about how you're going to post your transactions. The system will automatically post them uh, for you. Um, now, I did want to talk again about that um, um, bank account. Um, if you're going to use accounts payable and write checks, um, you need to go into your setup. 
and click on the bank accounts and you'll need to set up at least one bank account in here. Um, the bank account ties to the GL account that is set up as a bank account. So it's kind of a link between the two when you set that up. So what's going to happen is, is when you go into your GL account, you're going to create different bank accounts um, that you're going to do that. And only can, bank accounts can receive money or can, um, you can actually write checks against. Um, so let's go back into the setup and let's choose our bank accounts. And so you'll notice I have set up one bank account. I'm going to click on this. And there is my bank account that I, cre I created. If I click edit, I can edit it. Um, I should have been more consistent. The GL says Huntington Bank. This says Citizens. I'm just going to change this to Huntington. I'll click Save here. Now, you'll notice within the bank account, the first thing you see is the register. This is every deposit, check, or payment that we wrote against this account. Um, and let me just go here. So here we could see the, um, the, uh, the uh, $600 check that we wrote today against this account. You'll notice on the, on the uh, uh, bank account, um, you will be able to see the uh, balance of it and, and so on. Now, the other thing you'll be able to do, um, you will be able to do is you'll be able to reconcile bank accounts. Now, I haven't done a reconciliation yet, so I have nothing in my history. But when I want to reconcile the account, you'll just come in here and you'll say reconciliation. You'll pick the date through which you want to reconcile it. You'll give your bank ending balance. So I'm just going to say uh, if it was $10,000. If there was a service charge on the account, you can pick that. So if they charge me $25. And then you could pick the GL account that you want to expense that against. And I'm just going to say, I don't know. I don't have a good one here. I'm just going to pick this one. If you earned any interest, you could put that in there, and you could pick the GL account. There's also default values for these accounts, so they will, um, you don't have to pick them each time. And that's in the preferences. Once you click um, OK, it will then bring you to the form um, where you can actually then do your bank reconciliation from. Um, I have a tremendous amount of transactions in here, so because I've never done one. So the first time you do it, it's going to take a, uh, quite a bit of time to uh, load. And so that will then let you then check off all the, uh, the checks that were deposited, and it will let you check off all the payments uh, that you made um, so, um, through that date. So you would just come in here and start checking all of these off so that you can get into your balance. And then this will tell you what your balance is and what you're out of balance with. So it's really, really nice. The nice thing about this utility is if you want to discard it and start over, you can. If you want to save it because you're not done, but you want to, don't want to lose all your work, you can click Finish Later. You cannot click Save until you are in balance. And because I have a difference right here, I'm not allowed to save it at this point. So I'm just going to click Finish Later for now. And then it will come up and it will finish it. I could finish this later. And if I, you notice now, if I look in my reconciliation, there's the re reconciliation I started. And to finish it, I just come over here and I just click on it to look at there. The other thing is the to print column. And this would be any payments that I have um, made, any checks that I've written that I haven't uh, wrote the check for. Um, and once you write the check, it will record that and knows that you wrote that check so that it will take it out of this queue. Um, so um, the bank account is a very important feature um, within the uh, application. OK, let's go um, and talk a little bit more about, well, let's do this. I got a bunch of questions. So let me go through these questions, and then we'll talk a few more things before our time's up today. Um, how does the vendor get the PO? 
Um, we, you will have the option to both print it and send it to them, obviously, or you're going to have the option to email it to them. So you'll be able to email the uh, PO directly to the vendor. Um, is, bar is barcoding going to be an option one day? Very good question. The answer is we would like it to be. Um, we are looking into, um, because this is a web-based, how to connect barcode units to it. Um, but um, it's something that is on our development schedule. Um, we're going to do the inventory management module first, and as we do it, we will be looking into doing barcoding. Um, um, if the item pricing is wrong on the receipt, can we adjust the pricing prior to uh, paying it to match the supplier invoice? Maybe there was a sale on the product. Yes, that you absolutely can. That's the reason why you have the three-step process, the purchase order to the receipt to the bill. So the bill is where you can actually then go ahead and reconcile it and make sure it's correct. It's also the place where if you get the bill and they overcharge you, you might not want to enter that bill into the system and convert that receipt to a bill at that point. You might want to get on the phone or uh, contact the vendor and say, wait a minute, you told me I'm going to buy... I have a purchase order to buy it for $100, but you charged me $150. I'm not going to accept this. Now, they might say, go ahead and accept it, and we're going to issue a credit memo. At that point, you would accept it, make the change, but you can also create a credit memo. Once they give you the credit memo, you will be able to apply that credit memo to that bill, just like you can um, apply a, um, a, a payment to it. Um, um, is the check feature active yet? The check feature is active, and um, right now we have standardized on um, a QuickBooks check format uh, with the check on the top and the two stubs. So it's a 8.5 by 11 uh, check form. Uh, again, the check would be the, the top, and it's got two remittance stubs, um, the one in the middle and one on the bottom. Um, we will also be in, uh, showing you where you, else you can buy those. Um, because we have a, a place where you can buy those, a recommended place that's about half the price if you went to uh, QuickBooks directly to buy them. So, uh, but we did standardize on that um, on that form because we wanted to. We realized a lot of our users already have checks, and we didn't want to make you have to use a different check form. Um, uh, what about payments via credit card? We will, will we set up the credit card as a bank account and then have a corresponding vendor to pay all the uh, credit cards? So the answer is that would work. Um, we are going to be coming out with a credit card payment feature. Um, we made the decision um, to hold off on the first release to have that just so we could get this out the door. Um, but we uh, will have it, and it's going to work very similar to a bank account where you, you'll be able to reconcile it. Um, but that, um, in the meantime, if you wanted to use something like that, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, and is there a bank registry where I can just enter charges like utility, for example, or do I have to enter a bill each time? Um, you will be able to actually just create a payment on the fly. Um, so if you go into a vendor and you just wanted to write them a check without actually even um, um, doing it against the payment, you will be able to just add a payment to, to them um, and, and just pick the uh, expense line item you wanted to go to without doing a bill. Um, the other thing that you can do uh, and do have the ability to do within the general ledger is also add just general ledger journal entries. So you could come into here and just create a general ledger journal entry, and you could just pick the accounts that you want to debit and credit uh, for whatever reason. Um, and so you do have that features within here as well. Um, um, I knew this next question was going to come up, so I'm glad someone asked it. Um, is there a recurring feature for bills? Um, not today. And again, that was one of those other things 
that we decided um, um, we want to do and we knew people are going to want, but we wanted to get this out the door first. So we will be adding a recurring bill feature. Um, and that's really good for the things that you pay on a monthly basis all the time. Like uh, if you have a car loan, your rent, um, you know, the cleaning person. Um, so things that you know are the same amount every month where you won't have to go in there and just re-enter everything. Again, that will be coming out um, relatively soon. Um, with a, with a, and you're going to see a lot of other features as we talked about today as we get going. And we really need your feedback too. So we, we're looking forward to our users as you start using this to come to us and tell us what else we can do uh, to make the process easier and better for you. Okay, so we, got, we have just a few more minutes and um, I want to just go through a few more things in here, uh, within here. Um, let's go back into now um, the customer view. And we're going to change subjects a little bit. Um, something that's um, come up and, and just want to talk about because this is a new feature um, within the uh, within the application, the RMR tab that you'll notice right over here. We talked about this a little bit last time, but I want to just touch base on this again. So when you look at the RMR tab, you will see all of your current recurring items for your customers. Now this is a very nice feature within here because a lot of people want to report on their recurring revenue at different levels. So when you first go in here, you're going to see everything within here. So what I can do, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take off these two sort columns. So I'm going to get every recurring item. And what you can do from here is you can then, to do analysis with this, you could just take this data and say export to Excel. And what this is going to do, it's going to export it to Excel. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open that up into Microsoft Excel. So let's just make this a little bit bigger. So there is all of my data now that I just sent right into Microsoft Excel. So the reason why I wanted to do this is I just wanted to show from within Microsoft Excel, there's a lot of neat things you can do to analyze your recurring revenue. So let's do one thing real quick here. Um, and I'm going to create, um, and where do I do that? I do right here. I'm going to create what's called a pivot table. So I'm going to create a new cell here. I'm going to choose this pivot table. And it says give it a data range. I'm going to go back to my sheet of data here, and I'm going to pick all of my data right here from A to J. Okay? And I'm going to click OK. So I've just created this pivot table. Now from the pivot table, you could say, well, what can you do with that? So the first thing I might want to know is I want to look at my recurring revenue based upon its item code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my item code and I'm going to put that into my row feature. Let's make this a little bit bigger just so you could see the data better. So there's my rows. Then I'm going to say, what do I want to put in my values? I'm going to put my monthly recurring revenue into my value. Now it's showing me the count of recurring revenues, how many counts I have. So I'm going to do this again. I'm going to put the monthly in there one more time. But this time, I'm going to change this. And instead of showing the count, I'm going to do the sum, the total of all of those. And I'm going to make that into a number field and click OK here and click OK. So right there, you can see of the different recurring services, I have four Alarm.com accounts that total $95. I have inspection services. I have 85 monitored accounts that represents $4,000. And this is my grand total here, OK? So remember, I'm not looking at the total number of customers here. I could do that separately. This is how many individual service items, because I could have one customer that has both monitoring and alarm.com. So Excel is a very, very powerful tool to be able to do analysis and look at the different data elements of your 
uh, a recurring revenue, and obviously anything else within your system. So I just wanted to show you how easy it is to take that data from um, the RMR tab and put it into like an Excel sheet to be able to do this. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more you can do with this. Obviously, we're not there to teach you all about Excel, but you know, getting an Excel book or reading about it, or if you have someone who knows it, very, very powerful what you can do to analyze the data. So that's your RMR uh, tab. The, the, uh, this next tab, I'm going to go to this last tab first. This is your RMR invoice generation. So this is a new feature. It's only going to work for new recurring revenue when you run your recurring invoices going forward. But this will be the, will automatically record and save the history of each recurring invoice batch run. So you could go back and you could see, well, who got an invoice in this run? So if there's ever a discrepancy or you don't think something was working right or you have a question, this is just a nice place to come back and take a look at that. And again, you can export this directly to Excel. The, the last thing that's in here is this rate change history. So this is a really nice new feature. And that works with this button right here. And this is to give you the ability to do global rate changes. So if I needed to do a global rate change, you just come over here and say new rate change. Now, um, in my database, you could see in here, um, these are the next invoice dates for the different customers. OK? So you know, is this customer's quarterly or this recurring item? Some are semi-annually. Some are monthly. I've already done the May 1st recurring run in this database. So most of the customers will be June 1st or greater. But let's say I only want to do a rate increase for my customers that are going to have their next invoices go out to them in June. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next invoice, and I'm going to choose a filter, and I'm going to say is equal to, and I'm going to say June 1st. And I'm going to apply that filter. So now it only is giving me my, my recurring items that are June 1st. Now, let's just say that I only want to do a recurring uh, rate change for people who are getting monitoring services. Again, I can do that as well. And I could come over here as equal to, and I just type in monitoring services and filter. So now I'm down to this number of customers. So now I could turn around and say, what do I want to rate increase? Do I want to do a percentage or a fixed dollar amount? If I choose percentage, I just click that here. If it's a fixed dollar amount, I uncheck that. And then I say, what rate change do I want to do? I just want to give everyone a $1 rate increase. And then you're going to tell it, what is the reason? Why are we doing this? And I'm going to say it's because of a rate increase. Now, I can now go ahead and say, select all. And it's going to pick all 30 records that I have in there. But for some reason, if I didn't want to do a rate increase for this one customer, I can uncheck that one. So now it's only going to do the 29 that are selected. Once you pick your rate increase and you have this all down, you can then say preview rate change for selected RMRs. This is going to go off and get, get those 29 records. Sure enough, there's 29 items in this uh, list. And here's every recurring item. There's the old rate, there's the new rate, and there's the change. So if everything looks good here, I can apply this rate change. If there's something that doesn't look good, I can just click go back, and I can make my changes to make sure I got it right. You want to make sure you get it right before you actually apply it. So let's go back over here. Maybe I want to review this. So I can click Export to Excel and review the list um, before I do anything. But if everything looks good and I want to apply these rate changes, I just choose Apply Rate Changes. It says, are you sure you want to apply these rate changes? I click OK. And I apply the rate changes. Now, if I come over here to my RMR change history, here's every record in there. And again, I have 29 that got changed. 
So if I wanted to look at any one of these individually, I could just click on that RMR link. It's going to take me to the customer's RMR. And sure enough, here we can see on June 1st, we did a rate increase of $1. So we took their rate from the $29.95. We added a dollar. So their new rate is $30.95. Sure enough, their monthly amount is $30.95. So when we do the, the recurring invoices for the month of June, this customer is now going to get a $30.95 uh, will be their new rate going forward. So it's a really nice way to do your rate increases. Um, so if, again, if you have any questions on that, uh, please um, 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 submit a support center ticket. So I got a, a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, first question was someone asked, um, do you think you're going to add a payroll? And they put LOL in there. Um, well, I don't want to laugh out loud, but no. We do not have any plans to add a payroll module. Um, we, we will have interfaces so you can import the payroll from Paychex or ADP or a local pay, payroll provider, uh, but we do not have plans to do a payroll module at this time. Um, and then um, I got a nice little note here. It says, I used the RMR tab yesterday to raise prices, and it worked perfect. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. And um, I'm going to leave the, the conversation today with just um, uh, a little, uh, I guess, my two cents worth, my little opinion. I have the privilege to go around, and I've spoke at, um, I would say, 50 industry events over the last few years. And I talk a lot about on the, um, the, um, the uh, recurring revenue. And I talk a lot about rate increases. And I've worked with very large companies in this industry, small companies. The power of rate increases and the benefit to you and your business is incredible. I strongly suggest you do rate increases. Now, whether you do them once a year, once every 18 months, once every two years, but at some level, do rate increases. You know, it's very powerful. It's going to add, re it's going to add recurring revenue, which creates additional value for your business. It's going to create a cash flow um, and, and increase the, uh, the, uh, the amount of money uh, that you're bringing in. Um, but most importantly, your customers will accept them. Um, and um, it's very important to realize that, that if you're providing good services, periodically your customers will not frown upon you if you raise their rates a little bit. And, and you will be amazed at the uh, value and the benefits that rate increases um, give you. So um, I, uh, I uh, recommend uh, strongly that you do that. Um, so I thank you for all your nice comments uh, throughout the presentation. And remember, if you have any questions, uh, please um, um, submit them to the Support Center. And uh, again, we thank you for your patience um, as we put out this new release. And uh, thank you. And if, again, if you have any other questions, uh, just let us know. Okay, bye-bye.